Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas, and we are going through the entire book of Revelation. We've had over 50 lessons now on YouTube. It's pretty exciting. Uh, never thought uh, we would get this far, but we're here. We're in Revelation chapter 17 now. We're starting Revelation 17. And if you haven't uh, yet watched us before, uh, we just do a couple of videos every single week. Usually try to do a chapter a week. And you're more than welcome to jump in here if this is perhaps a chapter you're studying. Or you can go back to the first video and start watching it from the beginning. But you're more than welcome to break your Bible open right here. Revelation 17, probably at the top of your page, it says the great prostitute and the beast. And I have to say, that Revelation chapter 17 can be very confusing. Especially if you haven't read any chapters before or after. Like if I were just to take this one chapter and highlight it and say, here, just read this and tell me what you think, uh, it'd be very confusing. And, and even, even for someone who's been reading up to where we are, and this is one of those chapters that I think uh, is a good example of why people shy away from Revelation. But what we're trying to do is go slow, take it a little bit at a time, and really examine you know, what, what's written here and hopefully use some, some logic. So Revelation 17 verse one says, then, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. So right away, we're, we want to ask, okay, who is this great prostitute? And you know, is, is this a real person? And m maybe, and I, I think there's some study out there that people think that this might be a real person, but he, here's, here's what I think, okay? And again, this is just me using logic and what we already know about the Bible, right? Let's just think about this logically. In the Bible, the church it has always been called the bride of Christ, right? Christians have been referred to as the bride of Christ, and Jesus is referred to as the groom and there's references to the honeymoon there's references to you know the church and Jesus getting married there's a lot of wedding imagery and so if there's a bride which would be the church and she's the true bride then a prostitute would be a fake bride or a false bride and so if the church is christianity right following Jesus then a false bride would be a false religion, right? It would be, it'd be fake religion. And look at all these clues, like uh, she's seated on the many waters. So that would mean there's false religion in other parts of the world, in other countries, certainly. Kings committed adultery with her. Well, this just means that, you know, there's some countries, some rulers that have adopted these false religions and they, they preach these false religions and they make their uh, inhabitants follow these false religions. And it says that they uh, become drunk, right? Become drunk. And when, and when someone is drunk uh, here, we say they're under the influence, right? So that makes sense too, because when you think about even the Bible and all the stories of Israel, how many times do you see God do something amazing with Israel? Show them his love, show them some sort of huge miracle, rescue them from Egypt, right? And then it seems like Israel just forgot, right? Israel just forgets how great God is. And they go off and they pursue other religions. And you think, how can Israel be so stupid that they would turn their backs on God? Well, th th it, that's what happens when you're drunk, right? You make dumb choices. You, you kind of act stupid. And this is what false religion does to you. It places you under its influence. Verse three says, and he carried me away into the spirit, into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So, now we see false religion sitting on a beast, right? The two kind of intertwined together. 
And I think this is just the marriage between false religion and government. How false religion creeps into government and take, can take over a country. Countries can be ruled, right? And their rulers, their kings, their leaders, uh, make their people these converts to these religions. Plus, if we notice, right? I mean, it says very plainly, very clearly, that written on her head is the word Babylon. And Babylon is mentioned all through the Bible, and it's always been uh, a enemy empire that it, it worships a false religion. And where is Babylon in the world? Where is it? It's southern Mesopotamia, which is about 60 miles from Baghdad, Iraq. Okay? So here's the thing. I think when people read Revelation or uh, they start to hear stories about Revelation or they hear prophecy, right? We always think about the big one, the Antichrist. And we think, well, he's the Antichrist. So that means he's going to be the opposite of Jesus. He's going to do everything the opposite of Jesus. Jesus was good. He did a lot of good things. So the Antichrist is going to be evil and he's going to do a lot of bad things. No way. No way. The Antichrist is going to do good. He's going to do good. He's going to work miracles. He is going to bring peace. And the Bible tells us that his disguise will be so good. His words will be so convincing. His miracles will be so convincing that it'll, it'll, it'll sway even the elect. That's what the Bible says. That even the elect will, will fall for it. I mean, look at what verse 4 says. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup. All of those things are attractive, right? Think about false religion now. Look at the Mormon church. What makes the Mormon church so attractive? Do you think in their TV commercials, they tell you that, you know, if you get to a certain place in their religion, that one day you can become a god too? No. They don't, they don't do that. Instead, their commercials are filled with pictures of families, right? Do they tell you in their commercials that they believe that Jesus and Satan are actually brothers? No, they don't. They, they don't tell you about the new revelation, their new Bible that uh, Joseph Smith got. No, they talk about love. They talk about prosperity. They talk about happy families. So in that same way, I think that false religion, especially the false religion that Revelation is talking about is going to be so much more alluring, so much more effective. Jesus warns in Matthew 24, he says, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many are coming in my name saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. And if you look at verses 23 and 24, it says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, there's the Christ, there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. In other words, false religion and the Antichrist will fool Christians. Jesus warns, take heed that no one deceives you. How? How do you take heed? How do you prevent this future from being your future? The truth, right? We have to be students of the truth. We have to be chasing that voice and not others. Not, we, we have to be listening to Christ's voice and nobody else. Are we guilty even today? Are we guilty today of listening to other voices and not Christ? Yeah, you bet. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. And when I read this, think about how relevant this passage is even for today. Paul says, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is, each one of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized? In the name of Paul? Read that. 
Read that and think about where the world is today. Are we divided? Are Christians divided? Are we all saying that we follow so-and-so? And yet we're not saying that we follow Christ. Paul says you follow one source of truth. One. And I'll give you a hint. That source of truth is not on TV. <laughs> and it's not on the internet. Okay? I don't care how attractive or how alluring or how right-sounding those other voices are. Paul says, did TV die for you? Was the internet crucified for you? We have false religion right here in America. And it's been all we've been talking about for years. Paul says, is there quarreling among you, my brothers? Everyone is puffing up their chests right now. Everyone is boasting that their side is right. And Paul finishes this chapter in verse 31 and he says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Friends, the way to see through the lies of false religion and corrupt government is to stick close to truth. Don't be one of the elect that is fooled by beauty and jewels and a golden cup. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.